Few cars have proven more divisive among enthusiasts than Ford's Mustang II. For decades, many considered this much maligned mare to be a black eye on the face of the world's original pony car, a pint-sized pony, little more than a reskinned version of the equally unloved Pinto, out of step with its more muscular stablemates. But was Ford's second-generation Mustang really a bad car? Did it actually represent the lowest point in the Blue Oval's equestrian efforts? As with any automobile, to fully understand and appreciate the qualities and shortcomings of the Mustang II, we must delve deep into its history to assess the relevant factors that influenced its creation, as well as the needs and desires of its intended customers, and of course, examine the context within which it is now judged. On April 17, 1964, after months of hype, Ford Motor Company unveiled the unexpected Mustang. Based on Ford's economy car of its time, the Falcon, Mustang was initially simply a sportier, more stylish, yet still economical car. Mustang was an instant hit for Ford, and specifically for Ford Division's general manager, Lee Iacocca, and his team, including Hal Spurlich, Gene Bordenay, David Ash and others. It's important to note though that the Mustang at its launch was not a true muscle car. While John DeLorean and Jim Wangers are typically credited with inventing the muscle car with the release of Pontiac's GTO, Mustang, whose biggest optional engine at launch was a 289 small block, created the pony car segment. Initially, Mustang had no contemporaries. But as sales soared past anyone's expectations, General Motors, Chrysler, and AMC all scrambled to develop competitors to claim their own piece of the pie. Eventually, the pony car market expanded to include other iconic nameplates, such as Camaro, Firebird, Challenger, Cuda, and Javelin. They'd all follow in Mustang's hoofprints offering a wide variety of options at generally affordable prices. But while they too offered economical base engines and small blocks, they'd blur the lines between pony car and muscle car by offering big block performance options as well. Of course, for 1967, Ford grew the Mustang to accommodate a 390 sourced from Thunderbird. The car grew again in 1969 to accommodate even larger engines as the range expanded beyond GT models to include new levels of performance from the Mach 1 and now legendary Boss 429. For a time, bigger truly did seem better, but by 1971, Mustang, now a legitimate muscle car, had grown so big it barely resembled its former self, and sales were slipping. Iacocca had already been upset by Mustang's growth from the moment the 67 model was approved, having called it, quote, a big fat pig, unquote. This sentiment was echoed very publicly in May 1968 at Ford's annual shareholders meeting by investor Anna Muccioli. Ms. Muccioli confronted company executives, including Henry Ford II himself, saying, I want to tell you, Thunderbird came out years ago. It was a beautiful sports car. And then you blew it up to a point where it lost its identity. I have a 65 Mustang and I don't like what's happening. They're blowing that one up. Why can't you just leave a sports car small? I mean, you keep blowing them up and starting another little one. Blow that one up and start another one. I mean, why don't you just leave them? The chairman agreed saying, hopefully we will keep in mind what you say here and hopefully we will have a product that will be satisfactory to you. After having approved the even larger 1971 model, Bunky Knudsen was fired in September 1969, and by late 1970, Iacocca reigned supreme as president of Ford Motor Company, answering only to Henry Ford II. Iacocca wasted no time scrapping plans to continue evolving the current model, authorizing Project 80, which consisted of two separate sub-projects to be overseen by Nat Adamson, manager of advanced product planning, 
with the goal of developing a smaller, more nimble replacement, effectively hitting the reset button and returning Mustang to its roots as a small, sporty stallion, rather than the draft horse it had become. The first of these, codenamed Ohio, was to utilize the compact Mavericks platform. The second was codenamed Arizona and would be based on Ford's new subcompact platform used for the upcoming Pinto economy car. Sketches and models began to take form as Ford acquired a controlling interest in Ghia of Italy, who promptly supplied the first fully functioning prototypes of a dramatically downsized foal. Guided by feedback from consumer reaction clinics conducted in Southern California, two models, a three-door hatchback designed by Buck Mook and a more traditional notchback designed by Dick Nesbitt were selected, leaving the Maverick-based Ohio project to be scrapped as the Arizona project soldiered on toward final development. From 1964 to 1971, Pony and muscle cars alike saw a steady demand for more and more horsepower. Handling and braking took a backseat to raw power as the phrase, no replacement for displacement, seemed to transform Colts into full-blown racehorses. But by the 1972 model year, government emissions restrictions began to seriously stifle engine outputs. On top of that, pressure from the government and insurance industry was weighing heavily against convertible production, and stricter crash test standards were literally reshaping the look of even existing cars and trucks as bumpers grew larger and heavier. With brute power going out of fashion, topless motoring viewed as irresponsible, and consumer feedback and purchasing statistics indicating an increasing market for sporty yet luxurious imports, a variety of controversial decisions were made. The next Mustang would not be available as a convertible. It would not be offered with inline six or V8 engines. And it would abandon the segment it had created, dismissing its traditional competitors and setting cars like Toyota's Celica and Datsun's 240Z squarely in its sights. The absence of V8 power meant handling would be the most significant determining factor to endow this smaller, lighter filly with a sporting feel, without sacrificing ride quality. This proved to be a bigger challenge than Ford engineers Jim Kennedy and Bob Nickstead had anticipated. Eventually, an insulated subframe assembly that became internally known as the toilet seat was used in conjunction with a revised front suspension system that would become the single most iconic and popular conversion amongst hot rodders for decades to come. In fact, so many alterations were made to the Arizona platform, adapting it from its humble Pinto origins, stretching the wheelbase by two inches and making it ready for Mustang duty, that only the trunk floor pan and rear wheel housings remained unmodified. Finally, Taking into account buyers' clear preference for luxury and perceived quality, Iacocca instructed the development team to make this new Mustang a little jewel. Engineers went to great lengths to provide a decidedly luxurious feel and European flavor while retaining several of the classic Mustang styling cues. Externally, European influences were most noticeable in its newly redesigned three-element taillights. The hatchback's quarter window clearly inspired by Porsche's 911, and the notch back and Ghia's general mini Mercedes-like shape. Traditional Mustang design cues, such as its long hood short deck configuration and familiar C-scoops on the sides continued, accompanied by Charles Kretzitz's newly redesigned horse, now cantering across the grill. Inside, bucket seats and a floor shifter were surrounded by simulated walnut trim and thanks to Dick Allen and Larry Halstead, even more sound deadening material than could be found in Lincoln's Continental as the team pursued a limousine-like silence. By the time Ford launched what it officially considered its second generation Mustang, the new pony was already the subject of unprecedented hype and controversy. Original Mustang names like Lee Iacocca, 
Al Spurlich and Gene Bordenay were still attached to the new car. And as mentioned, several styling cues indicated this was still a Mustang. But enthusiasts gasped in disbelief that there was no V8 offered in a car that bore the same name as their drag strip favorites. Or did it? To mark the clear departure from the fat pig Iacocca felt his creation had become, he resurrected a name hearkening back to the 1963 prototype that had been built to bridge the design gap between the 1962 Mustang prototype and the production vehicle of 1964. Ford's second generation Mustang was to be named Mustang II. Despite the controversy surrounding its name and lack of cylinders, the launch of Mustang II would mark the arrival of several undeniable improvements over its predecessor. Its rack and pinion steering would provide significantly improved feel and coupled with its new front suspension, considerably improved handling. It would feature standard front disc brakes, a first for Mustang. The fastback roofline of its predecessor would be transformed into a European style hatchback that would increase luggage capacity and ease of access to it. And while the loss of a traditional V8 may have caused purists hoping for a stallion, to view Mustang II as more of a gelding, the new standard equipment four-cylinder was about to become the saving grace of this new horse. Once the new car was finally ready for production, Henry Ford II personally invited Anna Muccioli to come view the new yearling her comments had birthed. Although two inches wider and nearly 200 pounds heavier than her 65, Miss Muccioli was greeted by a truly trimmed down horse. The all new 1974 Mustang II was approximately a foot and a half shorter, an inch lower, and nearly 500 pounds lighter than the 1973 model it replaced. Anna was so impressed she traded her trusty old steed for the new foal. This certainly pleased Mr. Ford, and his fellow chairman must have appreciated Motor Trend magazine naming Mustang II its 1974 Car of the Year. But it was the Arab oil embargo that proved lightning really could strike twice. Ford's advertising department had already been heralding Mustang II as the right car at the right time. But as U.S.-Arab relations deteriorated, fuel prices spiked and gas rationing began to affect the daily lives of Americans. And Ford's little filly sat ready and waiting with its gas-stingy 2.3-liter four-cylinder engine and four-speed manual transmission. In a near-perfect repeat of history, Mustangs were trotting off dealer lots as quickly as they arrived. Though enthusiasts may have viewed the new 2.8-liter V6-powered Mach 1 as if it had been castrated, the public at large flocked to showrooms, their wallets open, eager to steer the reins of a less thirsty horse. By the end of 1974, Ford had moved 385,993 new Mustang 2s, scoring the best annual sales since 1967 coming within 10% of the original car's best-ever 12-month sales cycle and accounting for a whopping 4.75% of the total U.S. auto industry output. Knowing that initial sales were destined to subside, and having heard the outcry from enthusiasts, Ford shoehorned its trusty old 302 cubic inch V8 back into the Mustang II's slightly cramped engine bay for 1975. Initially available only mated to a C4 three-speed automatic transmission and choked by emissions equipment to the point of wheezing out just 122 asthmatic horsepower. It improved performance compared to its own four and six cylinder versions but fell short when compared to now upmarket former competitors Camaro and Firebird. And as sure as the sun sets in the West, sales did drop off. Ford dealers only managed to move 188,575 units during the Mustang II's sophomore year. Nevertheless, 
this still represented significantly higher sales than had been seen during the old flatback years. Aside from the reintroduction of the V8 in 1975, not much had changed to the model lineup besides an ultra-luxury Silver Ghia edition marketed alongside a young, mustacheless Tom Selleck, offered in addition to the standard notchback, Ghia, 2 Plus 2, and Mach 1 models that had carried over from 74. For 1976, however, Ford turned up the heat as best they could considering the political climate with the hope of leveling out sales figures. Noteworthy for 76, the optional V8 was massaged to produce 139 horsepower, a 17 horsepower gain that put the engine's output within 14 horsepower of the 1973 motor. And it was finally able to be mated to a four-speed manual transmission. Two new appearance packages were also made available. The Stallion package featured a blacked out grille, bumpers, body moldings, and a two-tone paint job plus large stallion graphics on the fenders. This was not exclusive to Mustang II, though, as similar packages were available on both Pinto and Maverick as well. The other new for 76 package proved far more iconic and controversial. Former rival and GTO marketer Jim Wangers had since left Pontiac and opened his own specialty shop, Motortown Corporation, near Ford World Headquarters in Dearborn. Motortown was in the business of developing, producing, and marketing limited production specialty cars for manufacturers currently too busy trying to keep up with the ever-evolving emissions requirements to develop such enthusiast-geared products themselves. Having noted the return of the V8, Wangers delved back into Mustang's not-so-distant past and drew inspiration from Carroll Shelby's original GT350. Replicating the performance of this already legendary snake was out of the question. With anti-pollution regulations becoming stricter almost by the minute, Motortown was unable to make any modifications that would alter the vehicle's emissions. But Ford was already increasing horsepower as best they could anyway, so Wangers set to work developing a cosmetic treatment that would include spoilers, scoops, Le Mans-style stripes, and graphics that boldly proclaimed Cobra II on the doors. Inside, Motortown ditched Ford's simulated wood grain trim in favor of brushed aluminum and the ponies for door plaques that echoed the Cobra II script from the exterior. The finishing touch was to be a new freer flowing muffler to give the car a slightly more aggressive exhaust note without actually modifying anything up front. Wangers then found an ally in Edsel Ford II, who himself felt Ford's own stallion package simply wasn't enough. The deal was made and Motortown began producing 1976 Mustang Cobra IIs. Marketed in large two-page magazine ads, featuring images of the new car above those of Carroll Shelby himself and the original GT350. The ad campaign and the Cobra II both looked great on the surface but purists were shocked that the Cobra II appearance package could be had with any of Mustang II's three engine options, eight, six, or even four cylinders. To be fair, any Mustang II, Cobra or not, equipped with the optional 302 V8, four-speed manual, traction lock differential, competition suspension with adjustable shock absorbers, slightly wider tires, and larger diameter anti-roll bars were actually able to muster similar performance to earlier small block Mustangs of the 60s. But modestly improved performance isn't what sold Cobra IIs. Ford had actually only anticipated selling approximately 5,000 units per year. But ABC changed that in a big way. On September 22, 1976, Charlie's Angels debuted, featuring Kate Jackson, Jacqueline Smith, and a young Farrah Fawcett behind the wheel of her Motortown-built Cobra II. The show was a hit for ABC, a catapult to fame for its beautiful leads, and a primetime weekly advertisement for Ford, 
who managed to move 35,000 Cobra twos in 1976, seven times more than expected. Due to its unexpectedly strong sales, Ford moved production of the Cobra II in-house for 1977, but despite the indication that Americans might be warming once again to the idea of a higher performance pony car, Cobra IIs still only accounted for one in five Mustang sales in 76. In fact, the majority of Mustang IIs, still aiming to compete with a variety of sporty imports, were still equipped with a standard four-cylinder engine badged as MPG models. But if nods to yesteryear, like the Cobra II's tribute to the Hertz GT350H rental racers of 1966, could generate so many sales, even if tempered by purists' frustration, Ford found itself gazing toward the sky, wondering if there might still be a market for open-air motoring. Not unlike how Ford had initially worked with Motortown to manufacture Cobra II, Inspired by Porsche's 911 Targa, Chevrolet's Corvette, and Pontiac's latest Trans Am, Ford enlisted the help of American Sunroof Corporation to create T-roof convertibles out of Mustang II hatchbacks for 1977. Priced at just $647 when ordered on Mach 1 or Cobra II models, or $698 on regular 2 Plus 2s, the T-roof option was a smashing success with open-air loving Mustang fans who'd had to make do with sunroofs or the Gia's slightly larger moonroof since the 73s went out of production. But despite popular belief, Ford's open-air Mustang II efforts were not limited solely to T-roof convertibles, as a very limited few true convertibles did manage to make their way to dealer lots, but not directly from Dearborn. In fact, Ford shipped a small batch of Mustang II notchbacks and Gias down to sunny Largo, Florida, where the custom convertible conversions were performed by MS coach builders. Dealers, excited to offer what truly felt like a slice of the 60s to their customers, promoted the cars enthusiastically, and the cars themselves, structurally reinforced and featuring an innovative power top design, did not disappoint. Unfortunately, Whereas the unexpected had been a good thing for Mustang in the past, the price tag associated with this conversion was an entirely different story. While a $650 or $700 T-roof conversion wasn't exactly a cheap option in 1970s money, it paled in comparison to the $4,500 price tag associated with Emmis's convertible conversion. In a time when a base model Mustang II's sticker price was just $3,984, plus Corvettes starting as low as $8,648, and even Porsche's 911 commanding $14,995, a Mustang II convertible that stickered at a whopping $11,437 proved to be far too extravagant a price for prospective customers to justify. So while Ford's contracted projects with Motortown to produce Cobra IIs and ASC to produce T-roof convertibles weren't entirely different than the attempted Classic II convertible series through Emmis, their outcomes couldn't have been more different. The run ended with just 44 units completed. Dealers who wouldn't be able to order another new Mustang convertible until 1983, and an American public left largely unaware that these cars ever even existed. By the end of 1978, Ford would turn their second-generation pony car out to pasture. What's more, just as Iacocca prepared to launch the all-new third generation of his prized pony, Henry Ford II would send him packing as well. But despite the apparent tone of the time, 1978 represented a very strong finish for Mustang II. Sales exceeded 190,000 units making it the car's second best-selling model year and bringing the overall sales total to more than 1.1 million units sold. Aside from a new set of graphics on Cobra IIs and a few other minute changes, 
like a split bench back seat and a new AM FM cassette stereo option. 1978 models went largely unchanged, with one obvious exception. Wanting to end production on a high note and aiming to satisfy performance enthusiasts, the King Cobra package would serve as the grand finale of the Mustang II's five-year run. Having weathered the critical storm of offering the Cobra II appearance package with less than eight cylinders, Ford dictated the King could only be purchased with their 302 cubic inch small block V8, now designated for the first time ever as a 5.0. The $1,253 package also featured other functional upgrades, including the Rally Pack's competition suspension, Lacey's spoke aluminum wheels, and new King Cobra exclusive brake cooling ducts. But while its interior remained completely unmodified, the King's exterior received the wildest cosmetic treatment of any Mustang to ever roll off the factory production line. Clearly inspired by Pontiac's popular Trans Am, it featured the Cobra II's rear-facing hood scoop and rear spoiler, plus new rear wheel spats, a huge new front air dam to house its cooling ducts, and blacked out trim, plus what seemed to be miles of bright contrasting pinstriping and an enormous flaming snake graphic emblazoned across the hood, much like the Pontiac's iconic screaming chicken. Advertisements proclaimed the King Cobra to be the boss of the Mustang stable. Yet despite its dominating appearance, its five liter motor was still the same motor that could be optioned in any Mustang model of its time. So while it performed well compared to its direct competitors, and even respectfully upmarket, considering the Corvette was now limping along making just 190 horsepower from its 350 cubic inch engine, this 139 horsepower boss still fell short of its spiritual predecessors of 1969 to 71. Still, this high priced option package was usually ordered with other popular line items such as an automatic transmission, air conditioning, and of course the T-roof causing kings to command truly royal price tags, sometimes north of $7,000, nearly double that of entry models. Consequently, production totaled just 4,971 units, making the King Cobra a truly elusive range-topping machine. Although it had endured the unenviable difficulties associated with serving as the first official sequel to one of the greatest automotive nameplates of all time, and keeping that namesake alive through such a difficult time that nearly its entire segment of competitors was effectively annihilated by political and economic factors outside the industry's control, Mustang II had done its job. It had sold well and paved the way for its Fox platform-based successor, to usher in the 80s better equipped to meet government mandated cafe standards. Despite its clear success though, in post-production Ford's Little Philly met its most difficult challenge yet, the challenge of public perception as a used car. Initially, the third generation Mustang's performance continued to underwhelm with Mustang II's 5.0 giving way to the smaller, weaker 255 cubic inch V8 of 1980 and 81 that represented the actual low point of V8 Mustang performance, making a truly asthmatic 118 horsepower, and the new Turbo 4 proving somewhat unreliable. But beginning in 1982, performance began to recover, and as dynamometers saw increasing power curves, the little Mustang II, now neither the classic model nor the new one, saw its reputation and resale values plummet. Throughout the remainder of the 80s, 90s, and even early 2000s, Mustang IIs were largely stripped of their front suspensions, harvested for hot rodding projects, and discarded unceremoniously, mocked, derided, and dismissed as an aberration, a mere pockmark on the face of Ford's otherwise stellar stallion. But in recent years, as modern muscle cars have managed to flourish in a sort of retro rebirth, and engine outputs have climbed so high that even entry models powered by turbocharged four cylinders 
now make more horsepower and torque than V8 models could muster even as recently as 2010. And modern V8 models generating double that output. Mustang too seems to be enjoying an unlikely resurgence in popularity. Thanks to the cavernous gap in performance between modern muscle cars and anything produced prior to the relaunched 2007 GT500, perhaps every past pony car has been given a new lease on life, a second chance of sorts to be seen in a different way, as the eyes of public perception now look beyond original factory performance numbers and at the beauty and other virtues each individual model has to offer. And now, as the better part of five decades have passed since its introduction, it seems no other nameplate has capitalized on this shift more than Mustang II. Now that prospective buyers of any make or model pony or muscle car, more than a decade old, must do so because of some motivating factor other than supreme torque or horsepower, perhaps now they see what Miss Muccioli saw in Ford's second generation Mustang. A small, sporty car not necessarily intended for a drag strip, but nimble enough to inspire a smile on a long, winding road just outside of town. Or perhaps they see a now rare mount, ready to have its 5-liter V8, suspension, brakes, wheels, and seats upgraded to make a truly unique yet budget-friendly vintage track or show car. Whatever the case and whatever the reason, Whereas for years you almost couldn't give away Mustang twos. They're now re-emerging from the shadows and commanding higher and higher bid prices at the country's most prestigious auctions. And thanks in no small part to the efforts of supporters like Ford Performance's John Kluwer, the Mustang Club of America's current president, Steve Pruitt, and enthusiasts from around the globe connected via social media this once forgotten pony is now celebrated with annual national reunions since 2016 and has been fighting its way back under the silver screen and into popular culture in ways not seen since Charlie's Angels and Starman. Finally, no in-depth account of such a controversial automobile would be truly complete without at least a mention of a model's life beyond basic factory production. For decades, regional and dealer specials like the California, High Country, and Twister specials have been produced in limited numbers. Third-party manufacturers and tuners like Shelby, Celine, Roush, and Steeda have bolstered Mustang's performance image in a big way. And of course, Private owners and independent shops have modified individual cars in completely unique ways for the street, track, and show circuits. So before we sign off, let's take a moment to shine a spotlight on a half dozen of the most noteworthy names and projects, and a few honorable mentions. Southern California's Galpin Ford was already well known for their custom dealer prepped Mustangs when Mustang II first arrived on the scene. And although owner Burt Beckman wasn't a fan when he first drove the car. It didn't stop him and his crew from galvanizing the new yearling. Every Ford dealer in the country moved a lot of Mustang twos in 1974, but none of them looked quite like the ones leaving Galpin's lot. Much was made of Mustang's recent ascension to the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series, but more than 40 years ago, Mustang twos were being used in NASCAR's modified and then new and all too brief Super Speedway Modified Series. Designed to bridge the gap between Modified and its premier Winston Cup Series, Super Speedway Modifieds were designed to handle the extreme speeds attainable on tracks such as Daytona and Pocono. So from 1977 to 1980, cars like Ray Hendrick's Mustang II, now owned by George Dodo Brockman, could be seen achieving ever higher levels of performance ultimately eclipsing the top speeds recorded in the Winston Cup, which in part eventually led to the cancellation of the Super Speedway series. While Ford never had any racing aspirations for its second generation Mustang, several drivers and teams took note that the car's lighter weight could provide an advantage if powered by a competitive engine. 
But Charlie Kemp's Cobra II race car in particular stands out from the crowd and secures our number four spot on this list. Designed to compete in the IMSA's AAGT class before being moved to the Le Mans GTX category, the car featured a chassis and bodywork by Bob Riley and a 351 cubic inch engine from Gap and Roush that initially made 560 horsepower, though later versions would generate as much as 635. The car was clocked 212 miles per hour at the Daytona finale in 1976, where Charlie took second place, the Cobra's best showing before it was retired in 1980. Although Kemp's deal with Dobbs Ford to produce street legal versions of the IMSA car fell through, it lives on today as a die-cast collectible and plastic model in a variety of sizes. Long before today's Stage 3 Roush Mustangs began tearing up asphalt, Cactus Jack Roush built more engines than just the one used by Charlie Kemp. Another such notable car was a 1975 Mustang II 2 Plus 2 owned by Joe Rigorello. Nicknamed Sudden Death, Joe's Mighty Mustang II featured a 505 cubic inch big block engine built by Gap and Roush, and eventually twin turbochargers. The car has been featured in Car and Driver as well as other magazines, and in 2009, made it on Hot Rod Magazine's list of the top 100 hot rods that changed the world. It was recently restored and put up for auction, although with a high bid of $45,000, the reserve was not met. In 1977, Monroe Shocks teamed up with Hot Rod Magazine and Creative Carcraft to build a car that would realize the full performance potential of the Mustang II, while highlighting Monroe's new handler shocks. Hot Rod detailed the build in its June, July, and August issues as Creative Carcraft fabricated an outrageous steel body kit, modified the suspension, and installed yet another Roush-built 363 cubic inch engine, making 400 horsepower. The project generated so much interest that six more fiberglass units were later produced and given away as a publicity stunt sponsored by Monroe, BF Goodrich, Centerline, Motorola, Revel, Roush, and Ford, Additionally, the fiberglass body panels were made available for purchase, and though they disappeared from the market for a time, are once again available for Mustang II owners intent on creating their own modern Monroe handler. Most recently, and perhaps most impressively, Brett Barons of Specialty Car Solutions in Portland, Oregon, afforded Mustang II possibly its greatest image boost when he debuted his Mustang Evolution at the Detroit Autorama and SEMA shows in 2014. Evolution featured a 6.8 liter Triton V10, six speed manual transmission, and interestingly, taillights from a 1977 Toyota Celica, and brakes and suspension sourced from a 2008 Corvette Z06. Unfortunately, Brett and his magnificent mount were involved in a rollover car accident in between shows in 2015. And at this time, the car has yet to be fully repaired and has recently been listed for sale. Nevertheless, Mustang Evolution has managed to pull off something so unlikely most folks would never have imagined it right up until the moment they laid eyes on it. It made 21st century showgoers gasp in awe at the possibilities still residing under the nearly half century old sheet metal of Ford's once loathed Mustang II. Now, after decades of being misunderstood and judged out of context against its predecessors and successors, this much maligned mayor, at times nearly criminally underrated, seems to finally be enjoying 
a bit of long overdue love. Since the earliest concepts through the latest production models, Mustang has evolved and adapted to the demands of the day. At times, this has meant going bigger, at times smaller. But from the most modest MPG to the wildest V10 award-winning show car, Mustang II may represent the single most important evolution of America's original pony car since number one, as it kept Mustang afloat while Ford navigated the deep, dark abyss of waters that were the 1970s Malays era manufacturing period. Every Mustang since, from SVOs to SVTs, and from EcoBoosts to GT500s, owes this pint-sized pony a debt of gratitude and respect. Even Chevrolet and Mopar fans owe a friendly nod to the Mustang too, as without it, Mustang surely would have been put out to pasture, and only because of its continued popularity into the 2000s were Camaro and Challenger resurrected from the grave. It's crazy to think that today's 700 horsepower retro rockets wouldn't exist if not for the perseverance of an 88 horsepower gelding whose occupants dressed in plaid bell bottoms and enjoying their latest eight track by Queen or Casey and the Sunshine Band, looked out their vinyl clad opera window and breathed a sigh of relief that their new Mustang II didn't need to wait in line at the fuel station. But it's true. And that's how Ford's second generation Mustang, Iacocca's little jewel that truly was the right car at the right time, saved Mustang and paved the way for every 21st century muscle car on the road today. Hi everybody, my name is Robert Kennedy. I just uh, made the documentary that you finished watching now and I wanted to sign off kind of giving you a little bit of background on why it was that I made it. Um, I was going to make a little credit reel, but frankly it was just going to say written, narrated, and produced by me, uh, and that's not really worth a, a whole lot. Um, this was just a passion project of mine with COVID-19. Uh, being a small business owner, I've found a lot more free time recently as we've not been doing a whole lot of business. And um, I'm an ex-Porsche tech, a uh, Mustang Club of America owner, and an owner of eight different Mustangs over the last 20 some years, including this King Cobra. Um, it is, uh, of course, one of the 4,971 produced, and as equipped, it's a one-of-one one car. Um, I gotta say, I certainly didn't mean to put any other generations of car down during this documentary, um, only to build the Mustang up. Um, you know, the, the fat pig quote, uh, I made sure to, to mention that was Iacocca's words, not mine. I would personally love to own a Boss 351. I think they're an incredible car. Uh, that being said though, um, working for Porsche, I got very used to driving very small cars. And that's one of the big appealing uh, pieces for me with the Mustang too, uh, is it is much smaller. It reminds me of the feel of the Porsches. Now given uh, that's a different level of car, especially as equipped from the factory, um, they handle better, they're certainly faster. Uh, and that is one of the biggest complaints I hear from folks about the Mustang too, is that um, from the factory, original performance is, is underwhelming, and it is. It, it, they're sluggish, uh, especially when compared to brand new cars, but that's not, that's not a fair way to judge these cars. They're almost 50 years old at this point, and uh, it was a difficult time. Uh, yeah, some of the cars from the 60s are certainly faster, but again, different time all the the emissions restrictions and all that hadn't come into play yet um, Detroit I mean frankly they were lucky to put anything uh, worth buying out uh, whether we're talking GM Ford Chrysler or anybody uh, so kudos to the engineers for figuring out ways to overcome those new challenges but um, you know of the eight Mustangs I've owned honestly this one's my favorite it's not the fastest 
Um, it's not the newest Mustang I've owned, it's not the oldest Mustang I've owned. But it is my favorite uh, because one of the big things I like to do, uh, certainly as an MCA member, is I take it to a lot of shows. And uh, it's the most unique car that I've owned. It turns the most heads, it starts the most conversations, whether I'm at a show or just pulling up to a gas station or, or whatever it is. And that's one of the things that I like about the car. I thought I'd quick kind of walk you around the car now, gonna show you uh, a little bit of my own personal. And uh, again, just to clarify, I'm not making any money from this documentary. This is done in my home office during the whole COVID quarantine. Uh, it had, if you're thinking it was a low budget uh, documentary, you're giving me too much credit. This was a zero budget documentary. Every bit of content that I, I received was either given to me uh, by a contact uh, from the club or from online, uh, the various Mustang 2 forums uh, and all this on, on Facebook and whatnot. So thank you to everybody that did contribute for the phone calls that I got, um, for the, the tips. Uh, I, I, of course, pulled some information from, from textbooks, uh, you know, history books and things. Um, if I've borrowed an image uh, that uh, didn't belong to me from, from Google or something, it was done solely uh, as, as a compliment uh, to whatever content that might have been. Uh, I think whoever you are and, and whatever you did, uh, you did a great job. Whatever car it is that uh, maybe you are the owner of, I think your car is beautiful and that's why I used it. Um, so please don't go suing me or anything. Um, like I said, this is just a, a $0 uh, passion project that I'm not making any money on at all. Uh, it's more of a public service announcement, really, to let more people know the correct factual information about a very misunderstood car uh, that I'm pretty passionate about. So let me give you a quick walk around of mine. As long as you've tuned in for 45 minutes already, uh, I'll show you mine real quick. I do appreciate you tuning in, and um, I probably won't see you next time because I don't think I'll make another one of these, but I hope you have a great day. So this is my 1978 King Cobra. It, uh, forgive the film work here, I'm trying to move my iPad around while still making sure everything's in screen from before. I bought it from the original owner about four years ago at this point. It's not a perfect car. There's a handful of things I'd like to do to it, as any passionate car owner might with their own car. But uh, it, it's a pretty fantastic car. And I'll go ahead and pop the hood here, too. And yes, I'm that big of a nerd that I've got my own car on my shirt. Pretty cool what you can find on eBay these days. There's the motor. It is a modified 5 liter. Uh, we've got MSD ignition. We've got a better cam in it. Uh, headers, of course. We've got uh, a whole variety of things done to it. Nothing insane. But that's kind of what I'm into is the light resto modding. Of cars uh, and I do think that's how these Mustang 2's are best enjoyed with just a little bit of power added to them so I'm gonna start it up take off have a great day thanks for watching I appreciate it and the next time you see a Mustang 2 I don't care whether you're a Ford guy a Mopar guy or a GM guy um, frankly I, I own each of those uh, with different makes and models and um, you know we all as muscle car guys we owe a debt of gratitude to these things for for keeping the the model line going through some really tough times have a good one